Dr. Margaret Adam is a clinical geneticist and professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington Seattle Children's Hospital. She spends 50% of her time evaluating and treating patients, 20% of her time involved in clinical research, and 30% of her time as editor-in-chief for the online peer-reviewed genetics resource, Gene Reviews. A major, a major research focus for her has been on the characterization and treatments of individuals with Moat-Wilson syndrome. She is on the medical advisory board to the Moat-Wilson syndrome foundation and worked in collaboration with us to develop the Moat-Wilson syndrome registry. Currently, she is working with the foundation and basic science researchers to develop a biobank that will further our understanding of the biological mechanisms that lead to the features seen in individuals with MWS. This is, the, <clears throat> this is the first step in helping us understand how we can design targeted therapeutics in the future. Dr. Adam is a graduate of Stanford University and is board certified in both clinical genetics and pediatrics. Welcome, Dr. Adam. Thank you so much. Um, it's wonderful to be here and I'm so glad I was able to actually see everybody go through the video because that's one of the things that I find so rewarding when I've actually attended the meetings in person is to actually see all of the people with Moat Wilson syndrome for whom we are actually doing this research. Um, and so it's my pleasure to talk with you about something that we have been kind of thinking about and working on for a while, which is the development of a biorepository. And so, See if I can advance my slides. Oh, it doesn't want to. Oh, there we go. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to be telling you um, the reason why we've been looking at setting up a biorepository, how we can interface this with the patient registry, and what we hope this will help us do in the future. So, what is a biorepository? And as the name implies, it's basically a place for us to be able to store biological samples. And what kind of samples might we want to store? And as you heard from Dr. Chatterley, a lot of basic science researchers are interested in genetic data. So that's one of the key uh, components that we would like, ah, sorry, my slides are moving. Um, to be able to capture in our biorepository. Um, so obviously DNA is important, but sometimes researchers want something more than DNA. So it's possible to send in a saliva sample or a blood sample, have the laboratory extract the DNA and store it. DNA is stable over years and years and years. So it's something that you can kind of put into a freezer and it's stable for a very long time. The issues with um, having only a DNA sample is that it is only able to give us a certain type of information, which is genetic data. And that is very important. And some researchers only want genetic data. Um, the other issue with sending in a DNA sample is that eventually it will be, if, if someone's using it a lot, it will end up being used up and you need to get another sample. Mm -hmm. And that's not problematic necessarily because you can actually get a huge amount of DNA from a single blood sample that can last for a very long time. But some of the researchers who are interested in studying this condition want to actually use more than just DNA. So a lot of researchers are hoping that we can also gather in a biorepository other types of tissues. And that sounds scary because anytime you're talking about collecting a tissue, that means there's something invasive that has to happen. Most commonly, researchers are able to use skin. So what we sometimes ask for for a biorepository is a skin sample. And um, it's actually really, really relatively straightforward to take a tiny piece of skin from somebody. It's called a skin biopsy. Dermatologists do it all the time. So if you have any unusual moles or things like that, they'll actually do a, a dermatologist will do a skin biopsy. They take a little sample. Um, the sample that we take for skin biopsy is about the size of um, a 
the tip of a pen. So it's usually three millimeters. We usually take it from the inner arm. It's a pretty straightforward procedure. The whole thing uh, takes probably 30 seconds to obtain. So, but it is something that you have to have done by usually either a geneticist or a dermatologist. Um, and why would it be important to collect something like skin? It doesn't seem like skin would be all that interesting, um, particularly when you're looking at the features of individuals with Moat Wilson syndrome. There isn't a specific skin feature that we generally see. The reason that skin is useful for researchers is you can actually grow skin cells in a lab, in a Petri dish. And from those skin cells, you can actually freeze down a little, what we call a pellet. And from that pellet, you can extract DNA. Um, and some of these cell lines are what we call, they can be immortalized, meaning that you can actually cause them to continue to grow and grow and grow in the lab. And so in some ways, a skin sample is something that doesn't have to be replenished over time. So once you've got a skin sample and you're able to grow it in the lab, you can keep growing it and you can keep obtaining DNA. So it's a more longer term sample. One of the other things that we've been approached about as a foundation is to also be involved in research like similar to what Dr. Chatterley was talking about, but looking at other organ systems in people with Moat Wilson syndrome. So for example, looking at how does the brain form in Moat Wilson syndrome? How might that be different from the way that someone without Moat Wilson syndrome, how their brain functions? So samples like skin, you can grow them in a lab and you can actually use some very special techniques and you can induce those cells. You can basically reprogram them to start acting like a neuron or a brain cell. So we don't actually have to go in and collect a sample of somebody's brain. We can actually kind of model what that person's brain cells might be like in a Petri dish by taking skin cells and then reprogramming them to act like neurons. And that's a very powerful research tool for us to understand some of the physical differences and functional differences for people with Moat Wilson syndrome. So one of the things we wanted to also look at with our biorepository is we want a place where we could also keep, grow and uh, store other types of tissues like cells. We've also had families approach us in the past with my child will be undergoing surgery for whatever reason, is there a sample you would like? So we would also like the possibility to take other samples that happen just because somebody is going to be having a procedure. Um, so things like if we could actually get a little piece, a little tiny sample of gut, if someone's having surgery for Hirschsprung disease, that's also very helpful. So instead of taking a skin cell and trying to turn it into a gut cell, if we've got a gut cell, great, we can just use that. So with a biorepository, the whole idea behind it is to collect a variety of different samples. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a variety of samples from the same person, but different families may be, feel comfortable giving different types of samples. So not everybody has to give the same type of sample, but it's a mechanism for us to be able to store those samples in advance, not knowing necessarily what a basic science researcher might be interested in doing, but having those samples available so that when we are approached by a basic science researcher, we've got samples that are ready to be sent out and used in a research setting. So that's the whole idea behind this is us preparing, not only for the researchers who we are collaborating with right now, but for future researchers to be able to once they have a research idea and they have funding in place, we can very easily get samples to them quickly to kind of move everything along. Um, so 
<clears throat> as I mentioned, this has grown a bit out of us actually interfacing with various basic science researchers. And Dr. J. Vivian was one of the first basic science researchers who uh, we have worked with as a foundation who also approached us because his interest is also in the brain or neurologic phenotype in individuals with Mollat-Wilson syndrome. So he has also been instrumental in helping us work on how do we build a bio repository? What are we gonna want in our bio repository? And again, I already kind of mentioned the types of specimens that we are interested in collecting. Um, so at this point in time, we actually, Dr. Vivian and I were looking around to find, is there a uh, company that already has a bio repository set up and what would that look like? Part of this uh, started right before COVID hit and we did find a place that was willing to take biological samples in a bio repository that was at Rutgers, but they basically semi shut down at the time of COVID. And so we weren't able to get a lot of information from them about what would the cost be? How would it work? So we were getting a little bit frustrated um, because we wanted to get this kind of up and running sooner rather than later because Again, we have been approached by uh, basic science researchers who are interested in obtaining these types of samples like Dr. Chatterley was talking about. So the good news is that another researcher at my institution, Dr. Rada Mirza, um, actually just got a grant to set up a biorepository at the University of Washington that is able to collect samples for any condition in which there is a neurologic or brain phenotype, including Moat Wilson syndrome. And she has a mechanism in place already for collecting these samples and storing these samples. And so at this point in time, although we are still looking around for, you know, might we want to actually have samples in more than one location or is it gonna be best to have it all in one location? Um, Dr. Uh, Mirza's lab is already uh, able to take samples. Um, and so that's very exciting. Um, and she is not gonna charge the foundation a fee for that because she actually has a grant to maintain this uh, bio repository because it is so useful for studying a variety of different genetic conditions, not just Moat-Wilson syndrome. So the next question I think people would have is, well, what if I wanted to participate? What if I wanted to have my family members submit a sample? To the bio repository. I think the, the biggest issues are around consent and privacy. Um, obviously, Dr. Mirza, who has a bio repository that is ready to collect samples, has a um, institutional review board or IRB consent already um, to allow the collection of the sample. What it would mean is it would, it would depend a bit on what kind of sample you were submitting, which consent you would sign. Um, but it allows their lab to take that biological sample and then um, either extract DNA and store the DNA or grow cells and then save the cells. Um, that would basically, anyone who wanted to submit a sample would get placed under um, a number. So the, the research lab actually has a patient, you know, information, name, date of birth, uh, things like that, but they assign a laboratory number to it so that when a basic science researcher wants a sample, um, they, the, the basic science researcher just uh, fills out a transfer of biological sample um, form and the lab will send them what we call a de-identified sample that Dr. Chatterley mentioned, which is a um, the researcher would get a uh, a number, they wouldn't know who the patient was. Um, and depending on what the research study was, they might also get some very basic information, such as if it was a Moat Wilson syndrome individual, what their ZEB2 genetic change is. So they would get kind of the really basic information that that laboratory would need in order to perform their basic science laboratory experiments. And again, usually that's they need to know what the genetic change in ZEB2 is because that's part of the point of doing this type of study. Um, then um, on the uh, 
laboratory side, again, the laboratory um, collects some very basic information about a study participant. Um, but as you also heard, it's very important for at some point, some basic science researchers to interface with clinicians to understand in more detail what clinical uh, features an individual has. So as Dr. Chatterley was saying, we need to know, does this individual have Hirschsprung disease? Do they not have Hirschsprung disease? And so in that way, um, I will talk a little bit about the registry and how we can interface with that. Um, so as Al already mentioned, um, we were very excited to hear that the registry was going to be updated into a little bit more modern format. Um, one of the difficulties we had with the registry that we set up, um, and, and we did this for a specific reason, but the difficulty was that most of the information was information that you as families would input into the registry. Um, so we weren't actually able to necessarily upfront collect kind of medical notes or actual images like a head MRI image or things like that. And a lot of researchers, especially if they're NIH, like Nas National Institute of Health basic science researchers, like um, to confirm everything through medical records, or they may want to actually have somebody review images or things like that. And so um, we were running into difficulties in some ways with um, saying, well, it's wonderful to have um, families tell us about their, the medical um, findings in their child and you know, what other physicians have said. But in many cases, it's really useful for a clinician to be able to access actual medical records. And so I think that this update to the registry is going to, again, be very powerful because it's going to allow research, basic science researchers who may have actually gotten samples from our biorepository to then come back to the foundation, to the clinicians who are uh, involved in the registry and have us give them the clinical information that they need to make connections in their basic science research. So the idea would be that, that uh, me as a clinician, as well as other clinicians and families would have access to the registry. They would be able to upload their medical information into there. If a basic science researcher is also someone who has um, clinical training and feels comfortable reviewing and um, uh, kind of interpreting uh, medical information because again, some basic science researchers are very much more on the you know, laboratory side and not necessarily the clinical side. But if we had a researcher who was adept at both, um, we could actually grant them through our, the way that uh, the uh, foundation has set up the registry, we actually, people can apply. Um, so, clinicians or basic science researchers who, again, have some medical training can apply to actually access clinical data in the registry. And so that goes through a formal process and we give them um, access to uh, participants in the registry who are also um, in, you know, enrolled in, in their research study and they can review those records directly. Or it would go through, uh, say, me or another clinician who would then interface with the researcher to say, you know, you want, you're looking for this clinical information, we can give that to you. And in that situation, again, usually um, me or another clinician actually has information about an individual's name and date of birth and things like that, that we need to just maintain the registry, but that information specifically is not necessarily shared with a basic science researcher. They don't need to know who is who necessarily. So there are a lot of, um, safeguards put in place for us to ensure that uh, individuals who are participating both in the biorepository and the registry, we have mechanisms to connect those two, but also we have safeguards to ensure that the patient privacy is maintained um, for these types of studies. Um, so in terms of 
what uh, Al was saying before, when we created the registry previously, I know it was a little bit clunky. Um, part of the difficulty when we first created the registry is that we were trying to anticipate what a researcher might want to know about a patient with Moat-Wilson syndrome. Um, we didn't have necessarily specific research um, questions in mind that we knew that basic science researchers or other people were currently looking at. We were trying to anticipate what those might be. That made it hard because we were trying to second guess what information would be important, what might not be important. Um, and so that was difficult. Now that we actually are starting to work more closely with people who have very specific projects in mind, and now that we have the ability to actually have families upload or have their care provider upload medical records, I think that this is going to be much easier to do than it was before. So I know that many of you have already um, put information into the registry about your family member, and we love that. Um, it may be in the future, we'll be asking for other specific pieces of information because in the registry as it was, we were really collecting some very basic information and particularly about what the underlying um, genetic change was in your family member and then some other basic data. Um, but now we will have the capability of saying, you know, if you're involved in or interested in this particular research study, we would ask you to you know, upload these specific medical records from your gastroenterologist, from your neurologist, from your geneticist, and things like that. And that's going to make it um, run, I think, much more smoothly. And I'm very excited about that possibility, especially now that we're talking about partnering biological samples with registry data and being able to use that to really further our understanding of what is um, of the research questions we want to ask, how can we help people with Moat Wilson syndrome? And to just um, let you know, for those who uh, are not aware, one of the pushes that we had for the registry in the last two years was a um, joint research question um, that was really led by uh, Dr. Uh, Ivanovsky and Dr. Garvelli in Italy in terms of how do kids and adults with Moat Wilson syndrome grow and how might their growth be different from um, typical individuals. And so I know, again, many of you participated in the growth survey and uh, wanted to let you know that this year um, that information was published. So there are now Moat Wilson syndrome specific growth charts that have been published and are available so that we can see the difference between how people with Moat Wilson syndrome grow. And that's very important for clinicians who are caring for your family member to understand that even though your family member may not be on the typical growth chart, maybe they're actually growing very well for someone who has Moat Wilson syndrome and therefore we don't need to be concerned. So that is one of the really uh, most recent publications that came out of the registry. Um, and although we did collect genetic testing um, information in terms of what was the exact genetic change that this individual with Moat Wilson syndrome had, that was not necessarily represented specifically within the growth chart, but was also an important piece of data. Um, so I just wanted to demonstrate to the community that we are making progress in coming up with clinical tools that we hope will be helpful to you and to your providers. Um, so in terms of kind of future directions, and this came up a little bit uh, with Dr. Chatterley's um, talk a few minutes ago, which is, what do I do now? What if I want to participate? What if I want to be part of the um, biobank? What do I need to do? So what are the nuts and bolts of how to participate? And I'm actually going to go to the next slide because it has my email on it. Um, so about three quarters of the way down the slide, you can see my email. If you are interested in having your child submit a sample to the biobank, contact me. What we would need to know is where you live, um, 
so first of all, are you in the USA or not? Because that's when you're talking about collecting research samples across borders, it's a little bit more complicated. Doesn't mean we can't do it, but we have to jump through a few more hoops. So if you're in another country and you want to participate in the biobank, the biorepository, it's, it's still possible, but it may take us more time to get that figured out. Um, so I need to know where you are um, and I need to know what kind of sample you would be willing to submit. Would you be willing to have your family member undergo a skin biopsy? Um, and if the answer is, I would be willing to do that, then we would need to figure out how to actually have that done where you live. And usually, like I said, if you're being followed by a clinical geneticist, usually a clinical geneticist can do that. And um, Dr. Mirza's lab is used to taking samples from all over the country. She also has taken international samples, as I said before. Um, but we would need to figure out a mechanism of, you know, we would need to coordinate with your provider who's going to be doing the skin biopsy and figuring out, um, you know, when is it going to be done? How do we get it shipped to us? And those are things that, that the biorepository is used to dealing with. Um, but we would need to inter interface with the uh, care provider in your area who is actually going to do the biopsy if, if you are willing to submit a skin biopsy. Um, I would also need to know what the underlying genetic change in ZEB2 is for your family member, because that's very important to pair with the sample. As I mentioned, um, certain researchers are interested in looking at very specific genetic changes in ZEB2. And sometimes they have asked us, you know, I would really like if possible to get a sample from a patient that has this type of genetic change, because my experiment is set up to actually look at that specifically. How does a genetic change in this part of the gene affect functioning in this way? Um, so that will also be very important. Um, and really that's kind of it, where you live, what kind of sample you are uh, willing to give and what genetic change your child has, or even you could even email me the actual genetic testing report um, so that I can look at it. So you don't have to actually know off the top of your head. Um, this is something, however, I wanna let you all know, it's going to take time to get this all done. So if you, you know, email me tomorrow and say, I wanna participate, we're not probably gonna be co collecting a sample next week. This may take a little bit of time for us to get everything up and running. And please don't be discouraged by that. I too want everything to happen very quickly. I'd like this all to happen tomorrow. But I just know from kind of real world logistics and COVID um, that this may take time. So please be patient if it's taking time for us to get this set up. Also know that um, for many of our basic science researchers, um, again, it's going to take time for them to um, go through their own institutional um, IRBs and things like that to get things up and running. So again, when we're doing this type of research, I think we all need to remember that this frequently happens on a very long time scale. And again, I know that's frustrating. I'm frustrated too, but just realize that although there is this very wonderful research going on it's gonna take time for us to actually be able to do all of this research, get data, synthesize that data and get information back to the community. I do wanna say though, that I saw my very first Mohawk Wilson syndrome patient 20 years ago. And 20 years ago, the biggest issue we had was people actually knowing what Mohawk Wilson syndrome was and educating providers to be able to recognize it. And in 20 years we've gone to, now we've got more than one basic science researcher who has contacted us and wants to do research in this condition. And for me, that is amazing because there are other conditions that we've known about for 30, 40, 50 years and there are no, very few researchers working on it. So right now I think is a very exciting time for Moat Wilson syndrome and we're getting a lot of interest from researchers around the world who want to collaborate and work together on various aspects of Moat Wilson syndrome. Um, 
And I believe that there is another researcher who is going to be presenting at this conference, Rebecca Charney. Is that correct? She hasn't presented yet, correct? <laughs> um, so she also was interested in um, collecting uh, genetic information and is gonna be again, looking at the brain phenotype in individuals with Malat-Wilson syndrome. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop there. Dr. Adam, thank you very much. I do have some questions that I've been getting off of the uh, chat room. So uh, the first one is, is there a benefit to do a specimen sample on an older, in this case, 35 year old, Moat Wilson syndrome individual? So excellent question. So I think we have to kind of look back and say, what, what is the reason for doing this research? And the reason for doing this research is actually to understand the underlying um, mechanisms that lead to the features we see in Moat Wilson syndrome. Um, so a lot of researchers are looking at what exactly does ZEB2 do because we know it has a lot of different functions in a lot of different tissues, but we don't understand what all of those functions are. Once we understand what some of those functions are, then we can start talking about, are there therapies that can be targeted to that? Um, so I would say in an older individual with Moat Wilson syndrome, um, really the reason for submitting a sample would be the same reason for as for anybody else, which is, I would like to participate in helping the um, community understand more about Moat Wilson syndrome. Certainly for adults with this condition, we have much less information about medical complications as they become older. So participating in the registry, I would absolutely encourage people who have adult family members to participate in the registry because I am now getting questions from adult care providers asking me, what they should be expecting in long-term health care for people with Moat Wilson syndrome. And it's very hard for us to answer that question because we don't have enough adults with this condition where we have that information. In terms of submitting a sample, um, if you wanted to submit a sample, it would help the research community. I don't know that it would actually help that affected individual in and of themselves. Um, other than contributing to our understanding of kind of what the basic science will be. One of the things that we have actually kind of shifted toward in the last 10 years, we used to think that the end all be all was changing someone's underlying genetic composition using something like CRISPR or something like that. We can, can we correct this genetic difference so that the, the protein uh, ZEB2 functions the way that it was um, intended to function. And that kind of um, pathway um, of treatment has been very unsuccessful. And Dr. Chatterley alluded to that a little bit. If we know that the function was very important in prenatal life and someone's now 10 years old, we can't go back and then kind of change what happened in the last 10 years. But what we have found is Oftentimes, these proteins like ZEB2 function in a pathway, a pathway that has a particular function. And we're finding more and more that there may be medications or things that can target that pathway that can then bring back function in a different way. So there are a lot of research groups that are now looking at, are there targeted medications that might be able to help with some features? But again, getting back to the original question, because I got way off topic there, um, would it directly help um, an adult individual to provide a sample? Probably not, but it would be helpful to the greater Moat Wilson syndrome community. That's what I would say. Okay. Then we had a question about uh, samples from parents, since Dr. Chatterjee mentioned that uh, the research that he's looking at, he was looking for the affected and uh, MWS individual and parents. So could you just comment on that? Yes, so for specific um, genetic uh, research types of questions, you actually, it's very helpful to have uh, family members have a sample. Um, the biorepository itself is not set up to collect 
um, samples from relatives, um, but usually the uh, relatives who are submitting a sample oftentimes don't have to submit the same type of sample. So oftentimes it's a blood or saliva sample from uh, a parent and we can collect that at the time that a specific research study might want to have that included. Um, so I think it would depend on the specific research study, but we are not collecting parent samples up front in the bio repository. Okay, so th this might then be related to whether or not Dr. Chatterjee's grant gets accepted and then specific plans will be put in place to meet his needs. Correct, and that would be true, I think of every, um, like I said, with the registry, we were anticipating what people might want. With the bio repository, it's sort of the same thing. We're anticipating what future researchers hopefully will want, but they may have specific things they need added onto that, like collecting other uh, samples from other family members. Um, but at least we've, got, we've gotten them part of the way there. Okay. Uh, had a question about uh, the samples that have been collected in the past and are at the uh, University of Kansas with Dr. Butler. Uh, can you just comment on that and how that relates to the plans for a biorepository? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so I have not communicated directly with Dr. Butler recently. He does have samples at the University of Kansas. We have talked with him in the past about how those samples can be used. The difficulty is that those samples were collected under a specific research, um, what we call IRB that was at his institution. And different IRBs have different requirements for what has to happen with samples. And when we talked with Dr. Butler the last time, it sounded like their IRB was not going to allow the transfer of that tissue to other institutions. Whereas the whole idea behind a biorepository is that it's very easy to set up a transfer agreement with another institution so that you can actually send samples to basic science researchers. So we are still hopeful that the samples that Dr. Butler has can be used in various ways but it doesn't seem like it's gonna be able to be used for some of the research that we've been approached about recently from other institutions. But I know that Dr. Vivian is working with Dr. Butler on that particular issue. Uh, and I'd like to add just a little bit to that. Um, Dr. Butler uh, did do uh, some work, I believe with those samples, but, uh, and they were going to apply for an NIH grant um, but I don't believe that they, I don't, I'm not positive that they did the application, but I know that they didn't get a grant for what to, they, for the work that they were looking to do. Um, I have talked to Dr. Vivian and he is going to update me on what's going on with those samples and that work. Okay. And we had a question about, uh, you had commented about, uh, when the samples are submitted, wanting to know about the type of uh, mutation. Uh, in this, this question is about, is there a specific type of mutation such as a complete deletion or uh, other manifestations that are preferred in research or does it not matter what, what the uh, gene impact is? Great question. Um, so at this point, again, because we're kind of anticipating what future needs are, um, it, I don't think it matters what kind of genetic change an individual has, because I think different researchers are going to have different projects that target different questions. And so having in a bio repository, having a variety of different genetic changes represented throughout the samples is going to be helpful. Um, so any kind of genetic change is something we would be interested in ascertaining. Okay. And one of the things that uh, we can do is uh, work with Dr. Adam to get more of the specific information on the foundation website so that you know more exactly what the steps are and, and put answers to some of these questions. So uh, I'll work with you on that, Dr. Adam. Uh, the, there, there are no more questions related to the bio repository, but if we have a minute, there was a question about, are there respiratory problems specifically related to MWS? 
Oh, um, also a very good question. Um, so in my experience, um, we have not seen primary, meaning um, lung issues specifically in most people with Moat-Wilson syndrome. Sometimes the lungs can be affected because the heart is affected, but I haven't seen specific respiratory issues. So if your child has those respiratory issues, we would definitely be interested in finding out more information about what those specific issues are. Because this is a condition that is, again, still, we're still educating people about this condition and we still don't understand everything about it. It's possible that this is part of Moat-Wilson syndrome, but a rarer finding that we are just not really aware of in the medical community. So if you want to contact me and let me know kind of what's going on, we would certainly be interested in finding out more about that. And then I can also talk with Dr. Moat and Dr. Wilson about whether they have seen that in any of their patients. Okay. Uh, again, along those lines of the information that you need, someone's just asked about, can you give an example of how the Z2 mutation is stated? Yes. So it depends on what kind of test your child or family member had. Sometimes people have a larger piece of genetic material missing and they, that was identified through what we call a chromosomal microarray. So some reports will say there's a deletion on chromosome two. Other reports, if it was actually looking at the sequence of ZEB2, it will actually say ZEB2, usually it'll say something like heterozygous, de novo, and then it will give um, a specific code. It'll say like C period, and then some numbers and something else. So it, it looks a little bit uh, like gobbledygook in that sense. Um, but it's usually done by a clinical genetic testing laboratory. So um, hopefully that helped. Okay. Uh, let's see. I did want to just make a comment. Uh, Dr. Adam had referred to the growth study and the charts from uh, Dr. Velli. Uh, I believe we are already have, going to post the link to those uh, charts on the website so that if you want to have access to that or any of your uh, healthcare providers want to see that, you'll be able to get that from uh, our website. So uh, Laura, is that on there or something that it's already there? Okay. No, I'll not see. yet. I am actually oh. working on it. I'm going to post this weekend and I will share on Facebook the link so everybody can have easy access to the growth charts and it will be on the website. Okay. Take to your uh, pediatrician, show them, uh, carry the growth charts with you when you go see your doctor. Okay. Let's see. We've all of a sudden uh, several questions coming in here at the end. Uh, has there been any research done with MWS and ADHD? Is there a link between the two? Um, so I'm not aware of any specific research looking at that. Um, I know that Dr. Moat and his group a number of years ago published data on kind of the developmental phenotype. I would have to go back and look at that article, which was pu published probably in about 2009. Um, they looked at a bunch of different kind of um, outcomes, but I don't think ADHD was one of them. Um, so I think that's a question that hasn't been answered yet. Okay. Are there any known Moat Wilson syndrome autoimmune issues? Um, so there's been a lot of interest in finding out whether there are actually any immune issues at all in individuals with Moat Wilson syndrome. We are aware of several individuals who've had, um, including uh, one of my patients who has had um, problems with their immune system where their immune system didn't work correctly. I think it's um, it, it, those individuals that I am aware of were all still very young and autoimmune conditions are possible in childhood, but are much more common in, um, you know, later teen years and adult years. Um, I worry that uh, the, the individuals I know of who have immune system problems could develop an autoimmune condition, but I have not seen any studies looking specifically at autoimmune conditions. And we haven't seen that yet in the patients I'm aware of. Again, this is another plug for 
if your family member is an adult, we would love to know more information about what medical issues they've had so that we can help answer these questions. Okay. Uh, question here, can MWS have constipation and not necessarily any other issues? Um, so there has been one individual reported in the literature from Asia who constipation was the primary feature. I think it's unusual that that's the only feature, but that has been reported in one person. Okay. Uh, officially, my son hasn't gotten her sprung, but he has problems of constipation. How can I be sure he doesn't have her sprungs? So that's a difficult question. I'm probably not the best person to answer that. So you would need to absolutely talk with your gastroenterologist about it. Um, from my understanding as a pediatrician and a geneticist, there are always situations where could there be a very, very tiny segment of the gut that doesn't have innervation? And could we miss that? And the answer is yes. Um, so, but we also know that about 25% of people with um, Moat-Wilson syndrome have pretty significant constipation and don't have Hirschsprung disease. And so um, again, this is where uh, Dr. Chatterley's research I think will be very helpful that um, I know within the, the clinicians who work with individuals with this condition, we feel that even if there isn't actual Hirschsprung disease, which is absence of those um, you know, nervous system ganglia in the gut, that the gut doesn't tend to work as well in moving things through in people with Moat Wilson syndrome. So even if there isn't Hirschsprung disease, there still sometimes are gut motility problems that I think are part of Moat Wilson syndrome where it just doesn't function the same way. Okay. Debbie, do we have time to go with a few more questions? I didn't, I didn't know what our time situation is. No, we do. We do have time. So okay. Feel free. All right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, just, Dr. Adam, could you just clarify what, what ADHD is? I know oh, I okay. asked that in my previous question. Just yeah. um, So it's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Okay. Is there any info related to liver issues and adenomas? Um, so not that I have heard of specifically. Um, but again, we are very interested if, if your um, family member has something that you haven't seen discussed before in the literature or with your providers, we would be very interested in um, learning about that. Um, Cause I just see here in the chat, someone saying that um, my twins who are 30 have uh, developed autoimmune issues. So Again, I think there are medical complications in this condition that don't necessarily affect everybody, but it affect a subset and we're missing some of them because we don't have perfect clinical data across the life. Okay. Uh, here's a question. My, my brother died as a baby of Hirschsprung disease and my son has MWS without Hirschsprung was told it was not related. Might this view have changed more with recent genetic research? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, it, it would be very hard to know. Um, again, if, if I was a clinician seeing this family in clinic, I would probably say the same thing just because as we know from Dr. Chatterley's talk, Hirschsprung disease is relatively common in the general population and frequently is not due to changes in ZEB2, but changes in other genes if we are able to find a genetic change. But could there be some interrelatedness between the two that we haven't figured out? Um, I think that that's some of the information that Dr. Chatterley is seeking in his research study of understanding what are all the genetic components that lead to Hirschsprung disease. And could people have more than one thing that causes them to have Hirschsprung? I don't know. I mean, it's certainly the fact that um, the, the individual with Moat Wilson syndrome doesn't have Hirschsprung sort of means that they probably aren't related, but I couldn't say that for sure. All right. Along the same lines, are there other complications of the gut besides Hirschsprungs in MWS children? For example, my daughter was tested for Hirschsprungs using a deep tissue biopsy with negative results. 
Um, so there can be other issues relating to the upper part of the gut um, in terms of, um, again, people having problems with um, the not being able to swallow properly or having aspiration. So when they swallow, part of it goes into their lungs or people that have um, problems with food, leaving the stomach into the first part of the gut. Um, so what we call delayed gastric emptying, um, we've seen that as well. Um, but like I said, I think that some people with Moat Wilson syndrome, just their gut doesn't move the same way and that leads to symptoms sometimes. I could add, um, if I can just add something to that, um, I think it's important to realize that when they do biopsies for Hirschsprungs, um, there's something um, called skip segment Hirschsprungs that, uh, you know, where just small segments of the, uh, of the gut are missing ganglion cells. And if the biopsy is not taken in that particular segment, which they, you know, they don't, I mean, obviously they can't biopsy the entire gut. So, um, you know, they can miss it. And, and I think that's probably a very real possibility in a lot of the, um, a lot of the patients that have just uh, slow motility is, you know, possible um, tiny areas of the gut that are lacking ganglion cells that just kind of make things move very slowly and, and miss a diagnosis. Um, and thank you, Debbie, for bringing that up. And there are centers, and I know that Debbie knows this as well, there are centers um, in the United States, I'm presuming uh, outside of the United States as well, who have gastroenterologists and surgeons who specifically work on Hirschsprung disease, whether it's with or without Moat Wilson syndrome. And we happen to have one of those centers here at the University of Washington. Um, and I usually recommend if, if your child is having gut problems, um, if there is any way you can make it to one of these specialty centers that um, you know, does Hirschsprung disease as kind of their area of expertise, um, that would be ideal. I know that's not possible for everybody. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up too, because <clears throat> we actually took my grandson to Cincinnati to the bowel management program there. He does have Hirschsprungs, but um, we went through their program and it was life changing for us. And I, I believe uh, Dr. Frischer, is that his name? Uh, I, I'm not sure who's in Cincinnati. Well, the, no, the one who's in Seattle now, I, oh. I believe shortly yes. after we saw him in Cincinnati, he went to Seattle. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he was wonderful. Uh, uh, Dr. Adam, can you comment at all about leg tremors, uh, especially uh, in, in the younger children? Um, so that is not uh, an issue that I have heard of uh, a lot. I, we, we do have some patients that I'm aware of who have some unusual neurologic findings that were not initially described with this condition. And we've tried to figure out what those are, but I haven't heard uh, many of my families that I care for um, having that as an issue. Okay. Uh, here's a, a question about in the world of pediatrics, how updated is information on MWS available worldwide? Um, um, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, so I wanted to let everybody know there is, um, I am editor in chief of an online resource called Gene Reviews. And there is a chapter on Moat Wilson syndrome that was updated in 2019. So you can find it at www.genereviews, G E N E R E V I E W S dot org. So, genereviews.org, look up Moat Wilson syndrome. There is a chapter about it. Like I said, I updated it last in 2019, um, and it has information about clinical features, management, surveillance, um, what the underlying genetic cause is. And that uh, is a resource that's updated every several years and is free, free on the web anywhere in the world you are. It unfortunately is only in English. Okay. Uh, question about uh, urogenital problems and frequent urinary infections. So we definitely have seen that in a subset of our patients. Um, some of them, 
have uh, reflux where they, when the bladder contracts, urine goes back up into the kidneys. That's something that a urologist usually can, can diagnose, but some people just tend to get a lot of urinary tract infections. So we have definitely seen that, especially if they have reflux. Okay. In, in your clinic experience, have, have you seen any correlation between uh, age and seizures? In other words, as, as the individual grows older, do they see a decline in seizure activity? Absolutely. Yeah. So we definitely have seen that. So even in individuals who've had very difficult to control seizures, which I know is not as common, but does happen, um, we tend to see seizures getting better after puberty. Um, for whatever reason, we don't know if it's related to the hormones at puberty or, or if it's unrelated to puberty, but in the teenage years, it usually does get better. Okay. A uh, question about vision problems and how, how that relates in, in terms of uh, how common is it and what are some of the issues? Um, so we do... I would say, um, you know, probably a quarter to a half of people with this condition have eye findings. The most common finding is eyes crossing, which you usually see in um, kind of childhood. So it's really, it's normal for little tiny babies in the first, you know, couple months of life to have their eyes cross. Um, but if it's persistent past that, that's probably one of the most common things that we've seen. It's sometimes called strabismus. Okay. A question in relation to the growth charts. Uh, it's suspected, is it suspected at all that there might be an issue with the gut not being able to absorb proper nu nutrients for growth, or is that unrelated to the, you know, smaller stature? Um, so I think it's unrelated partly because um, for many genetic conditions, um, we see people having growth issues, even if they don't have gut issues. At this point, we don't have any evidence that people with Moat-Wilson syndrome have problems absorbing calories. The absorption happens in the small intestines. And the biggest issues, as you guys all know, with Moat-Wilson syndrome is actually the, the large intestine or the colon not working. So I don't think it's related. Okay. All right. Well, we want to thank you again, Dr. Adam, for a great presentation today, taking all these questions. And uh, I want to just personally thank you because for those of you that don't know, Debbie mentioned that uh, Dr. Adam is our primary advisor on the registry. And uh, she is my main point of contact on everything MWS related. And she's always so responsive and helpful. So thank you for being such a uh, supporter for our community.